Because when this device that throws the images onto the wall was first invented in the English language, we called it a magic lantern. Because we had no concept. It was a lantern that was magic. An automobile was, of course, a horseless carriage. A locomotive was an iron horse. An airplane was a flying machine. Well, icebox, refrigerator, I mean, I go on and on. Radio, wireless. And this is, still, this is 120, 150 years ago. So the speed of innovation now gives us no chance to develop the language we need to think about the future. The 20th century brought us radio, television, computers, the internet networks, and today, the white heat center of technological development, the mobile phone, or the cell phone, if you prefer. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that the phrases mobile phone and cell phone will come to seem as outdated as the phrase horseless carriage. And I have to tell you, the phrases mobile phone and cell phone mislead us just as much as the phrase horseless carriage. A little later on, before I finish, I'm going to come back and talk about where I think the horseless carriage of the mobile phone is going, what it will become. But I promised the organisers today that I would actually touch on the key trends that are going to shape the future. Now, you've heard some of them from my esteemed colleagues, but I'm going to repeat a couple of them and not elaborate and add one or two of my own. The first is world population explosion. You all know about it. You've heard about it. It's happening. 6.8 billion today, 8.2 billion by 2030, 9, perhaps 10 billion in the middle of the century. Can we feed them? Can you help feed them? Will your robotic tractors, which are sampling the soil as they go and managing the farms for your customers, be able to produce the goods? I have no doubt of it. Is there enough water? Yes, there is. Is it in the right places? No, it's not. Will we be piping it? Globally, transcontinentally, will we be shipping it in tankers where today run oil tankers? Yes, we will. The second key driver of the future is climate chaos. Now, in any room I speak to, there's always a few people who are profound sceptics about climate change. I accept that and I respect it. What is clear to me is that the atmosphere is heating up and extreme weather is increasing. No one extreme weather event proves global warming. Taken together, to me, the message is clear. It's real and it's not going to get better. Now, we could have a debate in the bar about the cause. That's irrelevant. Let's take it off the table. Let's just say the atmosphere is warming that's dangerous. Can we do something about it? Yes, we can. Should we try? Yes, we can. And by the way, I kind of thought agriculture was the biggest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions when you take into account cattle rearing along with traditional agriculture because of the clearance necessary for it. But it is something which you're in a position to help with enormously. And I'm sure that's part of your plans. We have to, I'm not sure we can reach that two degree rise target this century. I'm afraid it seems to me like there may be a three or four degree rise, which is very serious indeed. The third key driver of the future is the one my two colleagues have referred to, and it's the continuing energy crisis. We have to move from a fossil fuel economy to a renewable fuel economy. I am afraid it must include nuclear because we have no other option. We have to shift over 30 years to cleaner energy. We must use it much, much, much better. 
We know what we have to do. We know what it takes to get there. Will our political leaders have the will? Yes? Heads nodding? Any head shaking? Let's pray they do, because we have to do it. The fourth key driver of the future is that wonderful word which produces anger in some people and hurrahs in other people, and it's the term globalization. Now, globalization, in terms of modern globalization, has only just begun. We're still in the earliest stages, and the whole century is to unravel before us. And in my opinion, if globalization is pursued ethically and sustainably, and those two words are crucial, then globalization is the greatest force for good on the whole planet. It has the ability to lift the 3.5 billion people who are not yet taking part in world development to a decent standard of living. When I was a youngster, a young boy, you know, teenager, I used to watch beauty contests on television with my tongue hanging out because they used to have those things on television when I was a young lad. And beauty queens, or the wannabe beauty queens, were interviewed often after they had paraded. And they were asked what they wanted. Well, they either wanted world peace or they wanted to cure world poverty. Well, of course, their responses were naive, but the desires are no way naive. And we are today, with globalisation able to look at almost the elimination of world poverty in the next century. That's something I believe to be noble. It's something I believe to be good. But it has to be pursued ethically and sustainably, and that means in a way that doesn't ruin the environment as we do it. The fifth key driver of the future are the revolutions in medicine, in medical science. Now, because I haven't got time, I'm not going to go into this very deeply. There are three big revolutions. The first is DNA profiling. In every individual will have his or her DNA profiled on a memory device. I stand before you as one of the few people who've had his entire genome decoded. And I have all of that information. And I walked into my doctor's surgery the other day and I pretended I had a big sheaf of paper under my arm. And I said, hello, doctor, you've often told me how other doctors shudder when they see people come in with papers off the internet. They printed about their illness, and they think, oh, no, this person is sure that they've got something. I said, well, I am your worst nightmare. I've got my entire genome decoded under my arm. Let's sit down and talk about drugs. I have to say... That the, having your genome decoded, and it will cost nothing in 10 years, will allow every medication to be tailored to you. At the moment, it's one size fits all. It doesn't work very well. The second revolution is, of course, stem cell medicine. You don't need me to tell you about all of the headlines you've read about stem cell medicine. Most of the excitement seems to be warranted. And the third, of course, is nanoscale pharmacology and medicine. I said I wasn't going to go on much about this subject, but I will tell you that most of you in this room are going to live a lot longer than you think. Not all of you, most of you. If you think you're going to be 90 fit and healthy, you're more likely to be 110 fit and healthy. There are, as David said, a lot of consequences for pension plans. But if you're healthy, perhaps you won't mind making a contribution yourself. The sixth key driver of the future is exponential accelerating technology development. And when I go to very posh universities that have big English departments, I sometimes say accelerating exponential technology. And somebody says, excuse me, you don't need those two words together because accelerating and exponential mean the same thing. That's tautologous they say to me. And I say, well, smarty pants, what I actually mean 
is that the exponential rate of technology development is itself accelerating. What does this mean? Well, it means that by the middle of the century, computers will have power that rivals human capability. Probably won't work like humans, but will be able to do things that we would say were of human level. The implication is enormous. Because of the way accelerating exponential development works, a year or two later, they'll be twice as capable, then four times as capable, eight times as capable, and so on. Futurists and futurologists call this the technological singularity. Because rather like a singularity in space, we can't see what might come beyond that. So I was invited this afternoon to look at 60 years hence for Valtra. I can't. I can look up to the middle of the century. But if all of this sounds a little worrying and a little depressing, let me make a confession to you this afternoon. I am actually a visitor from the year 2040. And I have come here this afternoon using a technology that I could explain to you, but you haven't yet got the language to understand what I would be saying. <laughs> and the companion, I have a companion with me on this trip, and she is called Maria. And Maria lives just behind my left ear under my skin. Maria communicates with me through a neurological interface. She speaks her wor words as if they were my own thoughts. When she wants me to see something, I see it with my eyes. And I first met Maria when we had a device, you remember, we used to call it the mobile phone or the cell phone. Way back in 2012, and the young guy in the shop said to me, we have a new phone and you can talk to it and you can let it have a personality, boy or a girl, or man or a woman, whatever you like. So I called mine Maria, because my own wife's name is Maria, and if I were to start speaking in my sleep, I wouldn't want to make any silly mistakes. <laughs> now, Maria has been with me for the last 30 years. She has become more and more clever each year, she upgrades herself all the time, and she whispers in my ear that, in fact, Shakespeare, although he wasn't writing about technology, knew instinctively that we are virtual creatures. And she's reminding me that in the last play Shakespeare wrote, which was The Tempest, and it was his goodbye to his audiences, and he wrote the part of Prospero the wizard for himself to play. And right at the end of The Tempest, he walks out to his audience, and this was one long series of goodbyes he was doing to his people, to his public. And Prospero says to the audience, we are such stuff as dreams are made of, and our little lives are bounded by a sleep. Thank you very much. Thank you.